We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Modrovix. Joining me today is Ron Parrott. Ron is a certified professional geologist. He holds degrees in geochemistry and economic geology, and he's currently the president of SME, the large U.S.-based mining society, and sits on the board of two junior mining companies. How are you today, Ron? I'm very good, thanks. thanks. Great. Feels, <laughs> field season's coming, so there'll be a lot of good activity, a lot of things happening. So. Absolutely. And uh, of course, this is part of our uh, geologist series where I'm trying to highlight the the importance of um, geologists in the in the junior mining and the, the mining space. So why don't we start by kind of what what drew you to get into geology and, and wanting to become a geo? Well, I guess as a, as a kid, I always had a fascination with rocks and uh, I had a, a course in high school in a, in a science program uh, several weeks on geology. Uh, false fossils, uh, all, all those kinds of things uh, intrigue me. Uh, but when I first went off to college, uh, I was looking at what what kind of a career path I could take that uh, paid well. And so I decided to be a chemical engineer. And I spent my first two and a half years at uh, Purdue University in their chemical engineering program. And uh, I needed some electives. And I thought, well, I've always liked geology. Why don't I take some geology electives? I did. And it was uh, night and day. It was just something that was so much fun and so interesting. And I seemed to have a, a real interest and aptitude in it. And after that semester, then I just uh, kicked over into a, uh, into a geology program. Uh, I had all the chemistry that a chemical engineer takes. I had a lot of engineering work as well that was part of that program. And so it was a natural then to uh, get the geology I needed and to combine those into a, into a, a geochemistry type degree. And, and I would say that a lot of that's really helped me too, because I, I'm always, I've always been very interested in the, in the process side, the metallurgical side of our business. And when you're working on an early stage exploration project, you know, you, you have to make decisions about whether or not you should keep investing money in a, in a project or not. Mm -hmm. And sometimes metallurgy could be a, a pretty key issue in those decisions. And not that I'm a metallurgist, I'm not. But I felt that I was able to understand things a little bit better from a mineralogic and, and geochemical point of view that would have impacts in that area. So anyway, uh, that kind of got me started. Uh, I, I had one year in grad school, uh, went out and I worked for three years, uh, got a leave of absence, uh, went back and finished master's degree, and then uh, continued work. And it was shortly after that that I changed jobs, I got more into the metal side. And in, in particular, if you think back to the late 70s, early 1980s, the price of gold had, uh, was starting to float now worldwide. Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard. Price of gold had been fixed at $35 an ounce. And now it was floating. And it was you know, up to $100, $150, $200 an ounce. In December, I think it was, of 1980, gold hit uh, $800 an ounce, which was crazy. And, you know, for, for me, I've, I've mentioned this to others working in Nevada, I, I was kind of there at a fortunate time because we were seeing this rise in the price of gold. Uh, we had a relatively new type of gold deposit in Nevada that was really not well known. Mm -hmm. uh, Newmont's discovery of Carlin, a, a gold deposit that you don't get nuggets of gold. You can't pan it. Uh, it's the gold is microscopic and it can only be recovered chemically as opposed to with physical processing. Uh, so we had higher gold prices. We had a, a deposit, a gold deposit that old timers walked over. They had no idea they were walking on gold deposits. And we had some new technology that was being developed by the U.S. Bureau of Mines in the late 70s called heat bleaching. And that combination just caused you know, discoveries and, uh, and gold production in Nevada to, to just hugely increase. You, uh, I always use a, a slide I have that shows the uh, annual production of gold in the United States, you know, starting, uh, well, one that goes back to about 1830. But when you look at the amount of gold being produced in Nevada in the late 70s, it might have been a couple hundred thousand ounces a year, maybe maybe 300,000. And, you know, it rose up to as high as about eight. And now we're around five on a more or less sustainable basis. <clears throat> but it's it's huge. Uh, the U.S. is producing more gold today than it ever has. 
going back to the gold rush days, all, all that. We're pretty, we're way ahead of that and continuing. So it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And, and it's been fun to have hit, you know, starting to look for gold, work for gold with those three things all taking place at the same time, which just led to great opportunities. And I was thrust into it and uh, hired a bunch of guys and, uh, and gals and uh, had a great time exploring and, and finding a few deposits along the way. So, so when we think about, you know, as you, as you say that, that advent of the new technology and that, that new type of, of deposit that was being explored and, and really capitalized on, Ron, is there anything like that that you've, you've seen since then that, that kind of parallels that, you know, in some ways that, that step change in the gold industry? Well, one that's, it's, it's not quite the gold industry, but, you know, everybody now is on a binge for lithium. And lithium deposits are uh, far and few between, it seems, anyway. They're primarily solars uh, now, uh, dry lake beds that have uh, brines that contain enough uh, lithium in them that they can be extracted. It can be extracted economically in the Andes. There are a number of those. And there's one deposit in Nevada like that that's been producing lithium carbonate now for gee, 40 years, maybe more. <clears throat> but there have been some new deposits found. And uh, they're not in brines, they're in claystones, in what might be old lake beds that have been around for a long time. Maybe there were brines, but now you have clays that are lithium bearing. And so the clays are being explored. And there's one big deposit in northern Nevada, another, uh, another large one in central Nevada that are very advanced in their permitting. And hopefully will be in production not too long that can help to supply you know lithium carbonate that's going to be needed for the uh, for batteries mm -hmm. so sometimes you find a, a mineral or gold in a, in a rock unit that no one's ever found it before and that's you're breaking a it's like a paradigm shift uh all the carlin type deposits when they were being found in nevada were always in the same rock unit the roberts mountain formation you had to find that secret rock that special rock and explore there but as things have evolved through time now, we're finding those deposits in a number of other locations. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the Long Canyon property that I was involved in the, the discovery of. Long Canyon is not in the Carlin Trend. Uh, it's off to the east quite a ways away. The Roberts Mountain Formation is not there. The traditional host rocks aren't there. Uh, when looking at that property, most people would say, gee, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting prospect, but it's in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. wrong rocks and when i looked at it it seemed fundamentally to me that it was a carlin type occurrence and I, you recognize that through the, the uh, geochemical associations the gold to silver ratios the alteration style that you see those characteristics that are common to carlin type occurrences and, and this prospect had those occurrences and it seemed to have the chance you know, to be significant because in areas of the prospecting that had been done, there were some pretty good grade samples, which is not unusual for a Carlin deposit, but it suggested it might be a strong mineral system. And so we acquired it. And, uh, and of course, the rest is history now. It uh, was by the time we got bought out of it, it was uh, something over 3 million ounces. It was put in production ultimately by Newmont, now being operated by Nevada Gold Mines. Uh, there's still a lot of gold in the ground and we'll see how much of it they can get as time goes on. But, uh, sometimes you have to look in different places with new ideas, uh, carry what you know forward. Uh, that's why I, I always liked, like to do mine tours. You learn a lot when you go see another mine. Uh, you stand in the middle of the, of the kind of thing that you're trying to find you know, yourself. Mm -hmm. So understanding the, the chemistry, the mineralogy, the alteration phases you see, some some deposit types have fairly defined geologic models that we can follow and use. Porphyry coppers, epithermal gold systems. Carlin type deposits do too, but they're one that, again, they're relatively new. And there's still a lot of things about them we don't know. We don't know where the top of the system is. We don't know where the fluids migrate from. Probably we have ideas, but it's not really that well understood at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But with those with those models and these ideas and and uh, you know what kind of rocks in general are good. If you, if you find a host rock that you think has the potential to host a carlin type deposit, and it's not the rocks that everyone's found gold in before, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be uh, 
uh, chased away from it, I think I'd look at it a little bit further and find out if there's still some, you know, there's some potential in a location like that. So you just have to use what you've learned and continually apply it, look at it, use it as a filter, a screen, and uh, iteratively go through these things. You can't plunk a whole bunch of money down on a on a prospect that's really out in the boonies and doesn't fit all the models. You'd kind of go at it slowly, poke at it, <clears throat> and if it continues to give you good results and help you along the way, you keep going. And mm-hmm. if you're lucky, you can find a discoverer. So back then, kind of go- going back to that project, Ron, what gave you the the confidence to really to to explore those new ideas and and to be able to um, go into a, a new system or a new type of host rock that really hadn't been traditionally explored that much? Well, in in part. Uh, we acquired the, the Long Canyon property, I believe it was in 2004. It was shortly after we had started AUEX. <clears throat> and we were looking for some good properties to build out a portfolio because our business model was to utilize partners, joint venturing, that kind of thing. And everybody has a different idea. Some people like what you have, some people don't. But uh, our thought was, if we have a, a reasonable inventory of properties, you know, then we'll, we'll get partners in. We can get some work done and, and see what happens. But with Long Canyon, you know, that was the case. We uh, we picked that up, acquired it, we IPO'd, and we took the IPO money we had and we did the initial phase of drilling on it from our company's perspective. There were some holes drilled by others before us. The area where Long Canyon was located turned out that the prior guys uh, back in the late 90s had drilled seven holes. They had a good geologic idea. They did all the right mapping, the surface sampling, soils, rock chip sampling, all that. And they came up with a model and they drilled holes to test the model. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the holes were, except all of them were pretty much barren, except one. They had one hole that had a 50 or 60 foot interval of uh, two grams. But if you think back to the 2000s, uh, 2001, two price of gold was 254 an ounce. People were getting pretty uh, depressed about continuing to explore for gold. And that company uh, ran out of money and uh, and couldn't continue. (coughs) Excuse me. Um, I looked at it at that time for a large company. I was working for a Homestake mining company then. And uh, Homestake couldn't couldn't pick it up. They weren't interested in it for those reasons. But what I saw that I liked, as I mentioned, was the, the chemistry of the mineral system. There was gold there, some pretty good gold samples. The gold to silver ratio was was very high, <coughs> which is classic for a Carlin system. Uh, Carlin type deposits don't have a significant silver byproduct. It's pretty much all gold. That's what you find. You might get 2% or 1% gold in a in a thousand ounce bar, but there's not much gold in them. So when you see a high gold to silver ratio, you see elevated arsenic, antimony, mercury, you see some clay alteration, you see jasperoids that carry those same same metals. You're seeing a Carlin type system. And it's just one that's hosted itself in different rocks, not in the traditional rocks that were, were, were Newmont and uh, Barrick and others uh, about a hundred miles to the West have made these other major discoveries. So it seemed like a good bet for a junior company. We're always looking at kind of the higher risk ones. This was off trend, a little bit different, but uh, it panned out and uh, it's, the story is not over yet. It's still continuing. Mm-hmm. So, and, and just to give our, our viewers some perspective on on what you've been involved in in your career, you were directly involved in the discovery and development of Rabbit Creek, Lone Tree, Trenton Canyon, and Long Canyon gold deposits in Nevada, totaling over 15 million ounces of gold. So were there any somewhat repeatable ideas or strategies that you took from one project to another? Well, the, the, the first discovery of merit that I had involvement in was the uh, Rabbit Creek property that was in 1987 and uh, even though carlin type systems and, and gold in general were, were new again on the exploration uh, front uh, companies were beginning to look in pediments in areas where the rocks aren't exposed at the surface uh, even even then the thoughts were that gee all the good deposits might have been found because they outcrop and those are the easiest things to find and so you begin to look in in other areas where you have geologic ideas that can be tested drilling through alluvium, looking at basement rocks. 
And, and Rabbit Creek was that kind of a thought. Uh, Coldfields Mining Company had found the so-called Chimney Creek deposit about three miles north of where we ended up making this discovery. Uh, but we did some high altitude aerial photograph work. You could clearly see some liniments, uh, faults that were had offset the alluvium apparently, but those traces were still evident. You could, you could see those. And there were a number of north-south features that went from that pediment area up north into the discovery area of the Chimney Creek deposit. So it seemed like a, a reasonable gamble to, to drill some holes, uh, poke down through the alluvium, two to 600 feet of, of just rock, sand, and gravel, and get into the bedrock beneath in proximity to those faults to see if, uh, if gold-bearing fluids had... Uh, emanated from those faults <clears throat> out into those host rocks and it found something like that. Well, and we did, <clears throat> and we found a deposit, but it wasn't in the same rocks that the Chimney Creek deposit was in. Uh, it was a little bit different geology, deeper in the stratigraphic section. So not the typical rocks that you see in the Carlin trend at Gold Strike and Carlin itself. These rocks were younger than that, still quite old, but younger rocks. So chimney was a, a new discovery, a new paradigm in a, in a different set of rocks. We found gold, Carlin type gold in a deeper section, but right on that same structural fabric. And really the lone tree deposit that came next was a big leap of faith about 20 miles to the south where we had a big fault zone, north south trending fault zone and, uh, and some other geologic data that, that said we ought to be drawing some holes here. And we did and we found an almost outcropping you know, deposit that ended up being about 5 million ounces. I think Rabbit Creek initially, uh, we went after it. The starter pit was on a deposit that was around 700,000 ounces, uh, but the grade was uh, six, six grams oxide material, which is very economic, very attractive you know, to process. <clears throat> and it grew from there. And I think by the time we merged or not merged, we acquired gold fields. We, we probably had seven or 8 million ounces of gold. Uh, the gold field side added more to that. The new discoveries were made on that property that are still unmined, still there. In aggregate, very easy to, you know, to see that kind of uh, total ounces. Uh, the, the Twin Creeks mine today produces several hundred thousand ounces a year. And it has now for uh, since, well, really since about the late seven, late eighties, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, so that idea that that looking in that covered area was a start, and then taking the structural data, the, the faults that are controlling the fluids that form these deposits, really helped to lead us into the uh, uh, Lone Tree deposit, that in the Marigold mine that was about five miles south of that. Uh, let's see what came next. Oh, Trenton Canyon and Trenton again, big structural zone, same structural zone. But now five miles south of the Marigold Mine, up in the, the heart of the uh, Battle Mountain District, uh, doing some generative work. We're finding jasperoids, which are, again, these rocks, silicified rocks that are associated with carbon-type systems. We're finding barite, which is a, a barium sulfate that's commonly found associated with these deposits. And sampling those and getting multiple gram per ton gold samples. That led to drilling, and that led to a discovery in rocks there that were basically the same age as the rocks that hosted the Chimney Creek deposit, interestingly. So a big a big fault zone. We, we made uh, a big to-do out of it in papers that we gave. Uh, we we call, called that all the uh, the rabbit trend. And on a, on a big scale map, you could almost draw a line between the Chimney Creek deposit, Rabbit Creek, Lone Tree, Marigold, Trenton Canyon, all the way down to the Cove property, which a company named Echo Bay had mined back in, in those days. So big, big geologic feature that appeared to control the distribution of fluids over a big area. Mm -hmm. So we we worked with that pretty hard and, and it was really good to us. So so some people have said that you're you're really a Nevada exploration specialist, Ron. Is there anything in particular about Nevada? Is it the the geology, you know, somewhat the let's say the momentum that you accrued over those different projects? So is it is it the the geology of Nevada that attracts you, or is it the friendliness of exploring there, the availability of 
equipment or exploration potential and the the really the the framework to be able to operate there. What is it about Nevada that makes it so special to you? Well, Nevada has always been, you know, a, a, I think a pretty friendly state to work in. As a mining company goes, the Fraser Institute always rates, which has come a lot later now, but it's mm-hmm. always rated Nevada as a great uh, destination to to be. I think from a fundamental geologic point of view, Nevada has it has the right rocks, the right heat sources. There are a lot of intrusive rocks, and I might say that you know the age dating uh, on all these systems. The Carlin-type gold deposits in Nevada range from roughly 43 to maybe as, as young as 37 mil, billion years old. So they're relatively young occurrences, relatively speaking. Uh, and so when you're when you're there, you have a lot of intrusive rocks in the state that are of that age. You have a lot of, uh, of uh, host rocks that obviously have have turned into ore hosts and, and made deposits. But it's just a it's just a good fit. Uh, Oh, the, another feature, there, the, Nevada is a big geothermal producing, geothermal energy producing state. In the U.S., uh, California is the big producer. They have a number of big plays. Number two is Nevada. And we're continuing to find a lot of geothermal systems in Nevada that are turning into power plants. Well, that thin crust uh, when faulting, which you need, also leads then to the movement of, of metals and through fluids that end up making carlin type deposits and, and did over time. So the, the ability to have, have that high heat flow, to have good host rocks, to have igneous rocks that are probably the ultimate source or at least the, the causative heat uh, engine that, that causes the fluids to flow and, and gather gold that can end up being deposited in these deposits is is why it makes it uh, just an attractive place. There are, there are copper deposits in, in Nevada too. And uh, there are a lot of people think that there's a, a, a distinct relationship between porphyry copper type deposits and, uh, and gold deposits. It's, it's debated, but it's not a bad idea to pursue among many. I'd like to go back to uh, something else you were, you were saying, Ron, about the property that you started exploring that had some previous drill holes on it. I know mm-hmm. a big difference between, let's say, for example, working in Nevada, or I believe it's most of the US, but correct me if I'm wrong, but operating on old properties that have been explored versus in, let's say, Canada, where that data is public. In Nevada, it is it is not. Is that right? Generally speaking, that's true. There's no requirement for reporting data to the to the state or to to federal agencies, mm-hmm. uh, years ago, a long time ago, we had we had to file data to hold mining claims. We have a little bit different land system in Nevada, and that uh, that ended in about ninety two. Uh, but before that time, uh, you had to spend so much money on each mining claim, and the technical data that you generated, you had to file with the Bureau of Land Management. And a lot of that ended up then with the state of Nevada through the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology. And you could access that data and you could use it where where it was helpful. But it wasn't all the data. It was a dollar amount. So if a company had a property and they spent uh, $250,000 on it, did some mapping, sampling, geophysics and drawing, they would provide enough data that would cover the required amount of money to be spent to hold the claims. But in 92, that was done away with. And at that point in time, the BLM said, no, you don't have to do that anymore. We just want you to pay us to hold the ground every year. Mm-hmm. So uh, so that's what, what's been going on since. And those fees to hold claims have continually increased. Uh, they're, they're reasonable now. They're, they're okay. Uh, some places uh, are less. Canada, I think, on a per acre basis, there's less to hold ground. Other countries, it's less. There might be a few places where it's a bit more, but uh, but it's not a, it's not an impediment to being out there and, and working. Um, so sometimes you can get the data then from others who have cobbled together uh, reports from companies they worked for. They kept a copy for themselves. They might have met with another guy and gotten some data. There are a number of people in the in the state uh, here that have been known as kind of data guys and. Uh, if you're moving onto a new property, uh, you might call them up and say, hey, do you have any data on this property? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, some of the old oil companies uh, who worked in Nevada over the uh, years, well before Carlin type gold was found, 
Anaconda, Kennecott, uh, for, for instance, uh, a lot of that data, particularly for Anaconda, now sits in a big, uh, uh, almost a museum. It's a repository for all of their exploration data that's at the University of Wyoming. And if you have a given area, you think they might have done some work there, you can go to the university and you can get into that database and find out if, if there is data, you can make copies of it and then use that in your own activity. Hmm. So looking back over your career, Ron, what were some of the most exciting times to you? Were they centered around making discoveries, acquiring projects or properties or different parts of the gold cycle in general? Well, the gold cycle has, has uh, when it started in 1980, has really driven what we have today. Um, you know, there's an interesting thing in the United States, if you look at gold production, uh, you know, back in the in the teens, 19 teens, you know, gold was $20 an ounce. It got increased to 32, I think, and then to 35, and it's fixed. It was fixed in price for decades. And we had gold mining through those periods, but those mines progressively shut down because costs rose, uh, things got more expensive, okay, price of gold was flat. And you could just see, if you look at a chart of production, you can just see how the, the amount of gold being produced just progressively fell off as time went on because the price of gold was fixed. So having this, now this buoyant up and down price of gold uh, was really uh, something that, as I mentioned earlier, really helped the industry to uh, to, to to really get excited and move in. It was, it was really a lot of fun to be there. And then along with the technology changes and the advent of heat bleaching, um, you know, a lot of a lot of properties that uh, people had worked on prior to that that would be half a gram or a gram of gold per ton is an interesting anomaly, but it's not ore. Well, today a one gram property is uh, potentially a mine, depending on the metallurgy. So it's made a that's made a big difference. Half, I would I would guess that about half of the gold being produced in Nevada today comes from heat bleaching, and the majority of that material is is under a gram in average grade which is kind of cool. And just to, um, just to clarify for our listeners, give us a quick rundown on what heat bleaching is. Uh, heat bleaching is a, a process where you have, let's say, an open pit mine and you, you're mining. Uh, you drill blast holes to, of course, fragment the rock. Uh, you load those, you blast it, and then you'll uh, pick up the uh, fractured rock. You, you uh, put it in a truck and you haul it to a, a pad that's been prepared. Uh, of impermeable material, uh, hypolon, other materials that are both durable <clears throat> but impermeable. And that, that broken rock, if it's a so-called run of mine heap leach, that broken rock you've just loaded, you dump onto that pad. And of course you put thousands and millions of tons on, on a pad. And then you put a sprinkler line out, uh, pipes, uh, most commonly they're gonna be uh, polypropylene type pipes that go out with sprinklers. And you sprinkle a, a very dilute solution of sodium uh, sodium cyanide on the ore. That solution permeates through that massive rock all the way through it down to that impermeable layer. And the pad is at an angle so that as the fluids reach that, that membrane, they then flow down that, the gradient into a pond. <clears throat> that water so-called pregnant solution because the sodium cyanide has leached the gold from the rock that goes into a plant the gold is recovered from that solution in some ores you get better recovery by not using run of mine which is less expensive you'll crush so you build a crusher and you might crush the rock run of mine you might have a lot of uh, one and two foot boulders <laughs> that go onto a leach pad kind of hard to get all the gold out of those sometimes. But if you put it through a crusher and take it down to, let's say, minus two inches or minus one inch, you have a lot more exposure with the rock to gold. So you can take that material, put it on a leach pad. The fluids will move through it maybe a little bit faster, but they're going to have more access to the gold that's in those rocks to recover it. So it's all a variance of, of uh, that kind of an approach where you fragment the rock, put it on an impermeable pad, percolate a solution containing sodium cyanide through it and strip the gold out that way. All started by the U.S. Bureau of Mines in the, in the late 80s. I'm sorry, the late 70s when it came about. So why was the U.S. Bureau of Mines, why was that their interest? Why was that something that they were developing back then? 
Well, there must have been the fact that there were these low-grade deposits. Again, if you're the typical way to recover gold uh, would be to build a processing plant. You know, uh, spend a lot more money, build build a plant, and you would find ores that you could mine that would be put into a crusher. They would go through a ball mill to grind them up into a fine powdery-like material, and then you would recover the gold from that. Well, that's a lot more expensive process. Uh, a plant, a cyanide plant, you're probably, uh, depending on the metallurgy again and issues, you're going to be looking at, let's say, 20 to maybe $30 a ton to treat the ore. Mm-hmm. In heat bleaching, the treatment cost per ton is, is a fraction of that. It might be six, seven, eight dollars a ton. So it's a lot less expensive. <clears throat> if it's a lot less expensive to treat per ton, then you can mine ores that contain a lot less gold. And there's a lot more material that's one gram or less than there is material that's three to five grams per ton, which you need for, for a mill when you're processing the ores. So I think it was the availability of low-grade material uh, that was oxidized, that was amenable to heat bleaching, that uh, led then to the mining, the metallurgists at the Bureau of Mines doing some experimentation. And they came up with this idea that you could, you could heat bleach material and recover gold. And, and again, it's uh, it's the dominant uh, production type. Many many projects are they never build a mill now. They'll just heat bleach it. Mm-hmm. it works pretty well. So is, is there a particular type of deposit or host rock that you would prefer to find a deposit in? Or do you see each deposit and, and project as a new challenge to solve? Well, they're all going to contain similar characteristics, but the, the reality is you have to do thorough metallurgical testing on every one. You can't make the assumption that it's going to recover, that you're going to be able to treat this ore just like you did the last one that's 15 miles away in another part of the state, maybe a different host rock, maybe the same host rock, but that doesn't mean the ore will process the same. So there are steps you go through and there are laboratories in, in Nevada and other places where you obtain large bulk samples. You take them into those labs and you do the testing that characterizes that rock. Uh, and for instance, what's what's the optimum particle size to get good recovery? Okay. Well, mm-hmm. you'll crush, you'll bring in a, a truckload of material that's maybe one foot sized boulders. Uh, you'll crush it just a little bit and you'll put it in a, in a column, you know, a, like a circular pipe that you put the rock in it and then you dribble solution in from the top and let it pass through. Well, you do that with, with uh, let's say, six-inch crush. You do it with three-inch crush. You do it with one-inch crush. And you look at the rate of recovery of the gold and the cost of recovering it and it versus the cost of the crushing. And so you can come up with this optim, optimum crush size for optimum recovery and, and the best cost structure you know, mm-hmm. to do that. But they're all different then. You have to go through that on every one to find out what the ideal and best way is to, to treat and recover the gold. Mm-hmm. So is is part of that optimization process part of being an economic geologist versus any other type of geologist? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, it's to me, it's it's all about dollars and cents in the end. Mm-hmm. I mean, if if you find a gold deposit, that's that's fun, that's nice. But you have to when you're exploring and you find some gold. Right away, I start went out with the guys I've managed. We start out right away doing cyanide gold assays. You'll do a fire assay to find out what the total content of gold is in a rock, but you'll do a cyanide uh, assay to find out if that gold is recoverable using cyanide Mm -hmm. easily. And if it is, that's good. Then you'll continue to drill. One decision, one one factor would be that. You'll continue to drill and see if you can make a discovery bigger. Uh, Again, something that's 40,000 ounces, 50,000 ounces, that's interesting. Maybe there's something bigger lurking nearby, but for most companies of, of any size, they're not going to try to build a mine on something like that. You're going to be looking for half a million ounces, certainly for a small company. Uh, you know, the hurdle rate used to be a million ounces. If you found a million ounce discovery in Nevada, you had you had the big one. That was really great. Today, <laughs> the big companies, uh, Barrick, Newmont, you know, that, that number's going well up now. They're looking for the three to five million ounce deposits is something that they want to go ahead and, and develop. So you have to go through this iteratively and and make those decisions to decide if it's worth continuing to explore. Maybe the maybe the mineral mineralization is refractory, meaning cyanidization doesn't work. And if that happens, then you've got a whole another 
series of tests you have to do to find out if it can be recovered using uh, autoclaves or roasters or other technology that can treat the ore to make the gold recoverable because it isn't in its in its primary state. Yeah. Um, and that adds cost. So half a gram deposits that are refractory are going to stay in the ground. If it's a five five gram deposit or better a 10 gram deposit that's refractory, but it can be treated through an autoclave or a roaster, then you probably have something that's going to, has a good chance to work. But again, you have to add dollars and cents to all that because it's all economics. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there are rules of thumb that you know I've I've tried to use. It, you're always trying to make kind of a guesstimate, a rough idea. Uh, many times it'll be a, a, a PEA, a, a preliminary economic evaluation. Does this have a chance to make any money? What's the stripping ratio like? You have, you have a deposit that's a gram and a half, and the stripping ratio is 20 to 1. That probably is a little tough. You know, mm-hmm. Stripping ratio is 3, 4 to 1, 5 to 1. It's a good chance you know that could work. What's the recovery? What, what does the test work show? Is this stuff going to have to be crushed to minus quarter inch? Or can we go with a uh, with a with a run of mine approach on it and get a good recovery for, mm-hmm. for, for not having to put that money into, into a crushing circuit? So you got to add all these kind of in. And I'm not saying I'm doing an engineering scale study, but you're trying to yeah, get a sense of does this have a chance to make money? And you can use some assumed costs. And you know, if if the cost of producing an ounce of gold, the value of that ounce of gold uh, and the money you've put into it, if if you can get if you if if you recover twenty dollars worth of gold and you've got ten dollars invested in into it to get it, that's roughly that's probably a good pro, uh, project. Got to keep working on. Mm-hmm. But if if it's if you recover twenty dollars in gold and it costs you eighteen, you got to find out what can I do to make it better, mm-hmm. so that it has much better economics because that's too close. That's not going to work as an investment. So you were mentioning that the majors are only really interested nowadays in going after these three to five million ounce deposits. Sure. Is is that you know mostly due to a function of the falling grades around the world in in gold ore, or is it simply you know for for some other reason? Well, uh, there there are probably a lot of reasons. You know, it, it takes a certain amount of time and money to manage a property and build a mine and operate it. And a lot of that's kind of the same, whether it's a big mine or a little mine. Uh, so if you're going to if you're going to spend two million dollars on permitting, <clears throat> go through all the stuff you need to to build a mine. Let's build big ones, mm-hmm. so that we don't we don't have to go through this again. It just makes more sense. <clears throat> I mean, Barrick has, uh, and I'm sure some of the other global companies have the same standard. They're they're looking for t- what they call tier one assets. Mm-hmm. Properties are going to produce a half a billion ounces of gold a year. Well, a typical mine life, let's say, might be 10 years to start anyway. Well, 10 years at 500,000 ounces a year, that's 5 million ounce deposit. Uh, 300,000 ounces a year would probably work for them if if it looked like it could go longer. But you want something that's going to be producing those amounts of gold on an annual basis to maintain your 3 to 4 million ounce per year global production rates. it would be hard. It would be easy, relatively easy, to do that with a dozen or fifteen large mines compared to thirty or forty small mines that take a lot of management time, a lot of effort. So bigger mines are for the large companies are are better than the smaller mines. Mm-hmm. So, Ron, when you're looking at a project that you're not involved in, what types of drill results or drilling plan do you want to see? Are consistent hits throughout the geological model that a team has built at a reasonable spacing key to you? Oh, absolutely. You have to have continuity. In the end of the day, when you begin to do a resource study, resource evaluation for for determining a reserve, hopefully, you've got to build that model and you've got to be able to be predictive in the end. You know, when we dig this hole in the ground or we go underground here into this area in the subsurface, we need to know the gold is there. Mm-hmm. You know, you, the first project we did, the Rabbit Creek mine, we had to strip 400 feet of alluvium to get to bedrock. Well, we had a big hole. We spent, in those days, it was a lot of money, $25 million to dig a hole to get down to the rock. Mm-hmm. So you wanted to make awfully sure that the gold ore was there. 
uh, I was standing on the pit of that uh, the, of that uh, project when it was first started. We were probably down two or three hundred feet with the uh, pre-stripping uh, with the president of our company, and he looked at me. <laughs> it was really funny. He said, "Ron, I really hope you you guys are right because we can't move the hole." <laughs> And uh, and luckily we were. We had adequate drilling. Uh, we had a very good geologic model. We had a good gold distribution model, and the resource estimate was very good. And uh, when we mined it, it came out just as it should. Mm -hmm. So that's that's very important stuff. A lot, a lot of I shouldn't say a lot. The, the few projects that fail economically fail because the uh, ore grade has been uh, misestimated, or because the metallurgy wasn't done adequately, and recoveries are too low. So is there a, an easy way for your average resource investor to think about and interpret grades and, and drill results when they see them come out? Or does it kind of vary by, by deposit type and project type? Well, again, uh, I, I think you always have to consider economics. And, and even if it's rough, you, you can do that. Again, if, you've, if a company reports drill data, and they're giving you uh, results. They've, they've got drill intercepts of, of 50 feet of half a gram gold, and the hole's 800 feet deep. It's at the bottom of the 800 foot deep hole. Is that economic? Probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, could it become economic with more drilling? Maybe, but that's a long shot. It doesn't mean you wouldn't continue necessarily, but you have to do it pretty cautiously because you've got to either find it shallower to reduce the stripping ratio, or you've got to find, uh, instead of 50 feet of it, you've got to find 500 feet of it uh, so that you can afford to strip off, you know, four or 500 feet of barren material over the top of it. So it's it's always kind of roughing out, gee, it's 20 to one strip ratio, a dollar and a half or $2 a ton to do the stripping, uh, a, a, a ton of ore, that's got a half a gram of gold, which today is what, maybe 30 bucks, something like that. Does that, does that sound like it would make sense? You know, and if you had a whole bunch of that, could it be economic? And, and what about the metallurgy? If it's a half a gram and it looks like it's refractory, that's another, another negative. If it's oxide and the gold can be recovered quickly using cyanide, that's that's a plus. So you have to take these into account. And there's just, in a sense, maybe it's just to me, but they're kind of simple things. But that's what I do. How deep is the intercept? What's the grade? What's the metallurgy look like? Mm -hmm. And then take a stab. <laughs> so when we think about, let's say, as you said, the advent of heap leach mining, would you say that Nevada has come over the years to be more known for lower grade or relatively lower grade, but big gold deposits that wouldn't have been, let's say, economically feasible without heap leach? Yeah, that's a good statement. Uh, you know, if you, if you look at all the mines producing gold in Nevada, the higher grade ones, the lower grade ones, add them all up. The average grade of mine in Nevada is probably lower than it would be in other parts of the world where the ores aren't amenable to heap leaching, you know, let's say. The average grade to mills, well, starting another way, you have a, what's called cutoff grades. Mm -hmm. So if you, if, you, if you have a gold deposit, it's going to contain a certain amount of material that's low in grade, some that's higher in grade. You're going to define a number. Okay, let's say everything that's one gram per ton or less goes to heap leach. Everything that's over a gram goes to the mill. No, the average grade to the mill might be four grams. Mm -hmm. The average grade to heat bleach might be 0 0.6, 0 0.7 grams. Uh, and that number varies, of course, with, with recovery and with the price of gold. Price of gold goes up, you might drop the cutoff grade because you can still make money on, let's say, one gram or 0 0.8 gram, 0 0.7 gram material. Mm -hmm. Some say that's not the best thing to do, but... It's it's a decision companies make how they want to approach that, <clears throat> but as as recoveries change, as gold price changes, the cutoff grade between the two can can change. Um, and with so much heat bleaching in Nevada, then you're going to see a, a a lower overall average grade you know produced. Um, 
There are new deposits, uh, you know, Barracks Gold Rush deposit in particular uh, is a pretty high grade deposit the way it looks right now. Uh, it's going to be underground, though. It's refractory, but it's got to be high grade then to be able to be economic. It's because uh, underground mining costs are a lot higher than open pit mining costs. And they're going to have to put that through an autoclave or, or some kind of uh, roasting facility to make the ore amenable to sign that agreement. Mm -hmm. So thinking now from a, a company standpoint, how do you prefer drill results being released? Is it important to you to communicate to market and shareholders in a strategic way with news, or are there any specific thoughts you have around how you communicate the news and the drill results? Uh, I guess it would depend on the, the stage of the project. You know, if it's an early stage, brand new exploration play, uh, you're not going to be uh, drilling 100 holes. You're probably going to go out a, a given program, might be a dozen holes, mm -hmm. maybe 15 at the most. And what you would usually do is, is drill all those holes, get the assay data back, and then release that data. Uh, if you have some interesting results in there, you might not want to wait because you don't want information to leak out. You want to release it. So if you had three or four holes with assays back and you had some good some good numbers in there, you'd probably want to release that you know, right away. Uh, but if the results are kind of up and down, kind of typical results from an early stage project, you might wait till the project phase is done and then report all that data. If you're in a more advanced state uh, in a project where you're going to be drilling uh, 60 or 80 holes in a given year, you would probably progressively release phases of that work to, to the public to let them know how things are going on the drill out. You'll be doing some infill drilling. You'll be doing some step out drilling. You might be testing some new targets on the property, all of which you know can have an impact then on the size of the deposit and its potential economic importance. Is it important to you to build a, a PEA or a, a resource estimate, or do you see that as, as secondary to really releasing proper drill results? And does that strategy really change based on what the company's goal for the project is? I don't think that you're not going to do a PEA, you know, every year uh, for, to publish. I think a company that's careful about things, they're always going to be looking at the numbers you're generating and making some assumptions. But they're but they're going to be not for distribution because they're just too rough. You know you don't want to put out some information that's just you know premature because you don't have enough data to to say with uh, confidence that this is really the way it's going to be. So again, usually if you're going to have done enough drilling, uh, enough holes to reasonably characterize the material before you'd want to do a, a PEA, get a more formal look at the economics where you'll hire let's say an outside firm. And uh, begin to get some, you know, some. Usually, it's going to be off-the-shelf data. You're going to assume some average mining costs. You'll have some recovery data from some preliminary metallurgy that you've already done, uh, so that you can you can you can let the market know that you know you've spent six million dollars on this. Does this thing get? <laughs> you've put a lot of money in this. The investors would like to know is this got a chance of being a mine? So you might want to take a first pass look at it with that level of, of confidence and data that you could release a number. Um, companies do that, I think, pretty frequently, especially if they're one that they continue to, to put money into. People want to know, you know, does this thing look like? <laughs> does, it, does it have a chance uh, to, to make any money in, in this price environment? Maybe instead of being $1,900 gold, wasn't that long ago, gold was, you know, $1,100, $1,200. Uh, a little bit of di a different set of economics when you have a price like that. Mm -hmm. So as an investor, Ron, are there any red flags that you'd like to share with us when evaluating a company to invest in in the junior area? Well, one one thing that I, I I don't like I don't like is when data is released, drill holes, intercepts are released, and the, the company doesn't make any any uh, declaration as to whether or not uh, the gold that's in those rocks, whether it's oxide or, or refractory, because it makes a big difference on the economics. Mm -hmm. Some companies uh, won't give any names, but they commonly are releasing <clears throat> some deeper holes. You know, they'll describe it some somewhat, and you almost know certainly that that's refractory material, but they never they never come out and call it that. Mm -hmm. And that to me is kind of a red flag, because uh, if you're deep and you've got two or three gram material. 
and it's refractory, you know, it might that might be a, a tough project economically. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they, as as I told you, I would do any any drill hole that the companies I've been involved with, any drill hole that comes in, that we get assays back, and there's a 0.01 ounce per ton number in it, you do a cyanide on it automatically. You, and you release that data with when you put out the uh, the uh, analytic data on the press release. You know, you've done cyanide solubles and the materials oxide. Just just do it automatically. But the, but if you don't know. Uh, and there's a, a suggestion that it is refractory, uh, and they're not telling you. It's I think that's that's not a good thing because it's so easy to do, and it's not a big expense. Mm -hmm. So when we think about times to get involved as an investor, there have been different strategies like the pre-production dip on the Lasan curve, for example. Are there any particular times that you think about getting involved as an investor? Well, it's. Uh, <laughs> I guess it depends on how well you think you can assess the data that's put out. Uh, I, I know a number of people, Brent Cook, one, Louis James, another. Mm -hmm. These are guys that have been in the business a, a long time now. And and that's kind of their job if you want to buy their newsletter, that they'll they'll look at the data at an early stage and and try to try to either put it on a buy list or a wait and see list, depending on on how they see it. Um, if if a company uh, does a first pass drilling project uh, program on a project, let's say that, again they put in 10, 12, 15 holes, and they release a bunch of good good data, uh, if you feel competent enough to assess what that data means, you know as I was saying from the grade, the depth, the metallurgy, then uh, you might make a decision. Well, right, let's gamble and put some money into this. Maybe you know buy a small position, watch the project progress. You know, data continues to come in that's looking interesting, you know, expand your position, that kind of a thing. <clears throat> but it's, you know, it's like when large companies are buying smaller companies, they look at the uh, data very carefully with professional eyes and they're looking for upside. You know, if I'm going to buy XYZ company and I'm going to pay $200 million to get it, uh, you know, I want, to, I want to see some upside in the investment so that uh, down the road, you know, I won't be criticized for having way overspent buying a small gold deposit. You put a pretty heavy burden on a small deposit if you if you miss that uh, that judgment. So. So and just to contrast that, Ron, when you're when you're trying to build a gold explorer, is there a particular time in the gold cycle that you want to be picking up or, or drilling properties? Well, certainly picking up properties. If you if you have the treasury, and the and I'd, I'd call it the wisdom to be foresightful in in these things. When when gold is down, that's when prop, good properties are potentially available, and that's the time to you know throw some new things into your portfolio. You know, look at over this this uh, array of projects that are out there. <clears throat> You've got a geologic team. They don't always explore on your new things. They ought to be out looking at other opportunities too to fill your portfolio so that. When uh, when things change, or you have your other group can take those over then and advance them, but uh, definitely, uh, but it takes you know it takes some vision because the, the thought is well gee the price of gold is back in two thousand one or two it was two fifty four an ounce and there were people saying well it's, gold is done yeah you know, we're never going to see good gold prices again so why should we spend money picking up these doggy properties mm -hmm. well some of those could turn out to be long canyons which is you know what happened for us mm -hmm. so i would have i would have never had a chance to uh to drill the holes that i did on that property had times been different because i know all the guys that worked on for that company before a bunch of them worked for me in a prior job prior life and they're smart guys and if they'd been given a little more money they would have made that discovery but i got the chance to do it so so are there any any strategies that the junior companies would use to make themselves more attractive as takeout targets for major gold companies, such as, let's say, maybe buying out royalties on a project? Well, again, it's uh, a lot of these decisions are just are just hard and uh, you have to look at the data carefully uh, to see if uh, if this 
if that project has a chance to uh, you know to make it. I mean, there there are a number of new royalty companies out there now. Uh, they're all doing that. They're all looking at opportunities. Uh, I I think at times some some jump on a royalty that they can get cheaply just to buy another royalty. And and you'd look at the project and say, well, what's the royalty on? You know, do they have something here that's uh, maybe has a chance to grow or become, you know, of some economic merit that would actually produce a royalty that you could get <clears throat> rather than uh, just simply uh, we have a big package, uh, a big package of properties. You know, we can take a royalty on this whole package and uh, maybe one of them will work out kind of an approach. Maybe that's a good strategy. I'm not criticizing them. I'm not in that business. But uh, if the property has had some work done on it and it can be looked at, again, a, a good team can probably assess the likelihood of something uh, panning out and, uh, and then gamble because in the end, it's uh, you don't know where it's going to end up. For. You don't know where the price of gold is going to be. Mm -hmm. We think it's never going to go down again materially, but uh, even at 1900, we could see it pretty good dive in the price of gold that can happen mm -hmm. so and and you know as a as a junior are there any strategies that would make them let's say more attractive to being takeout targets for majors uh, or just well, having well, a good deposit is is mostly what it comes down to well certainly having a good deposit is the, is the first thing and higher higher the grade the better Good metallurgy, better, low strip ratio, obvious good economics. Uh, I know with Long with Long Canyon, not too far into that project, uh, not not the first year, but certainly within two or three years, it, it looked to me like this this got every chance to be a mine, and I was comfortable saying that because I had been through that process before on other properties, and that that just looked it looked like it was, I wouldn't say a no brainer and they're, they're never quite like that, but uh, this was as close to that as you could be. The grade was phenomenal and uh, ox, the metallurgy was some of the best I'd ever seen. Strip ratio was low. It's, it's probably going to happen. So sometimes uh, if, if you have a property that has those things going for it, the work has been done by professionals, people that can be trusted. Uh, the laboratories doing the metallurgy are, are good people that you know and, and trust. Uh, the people doing the PEAs or the preliminary feasibility studies are first rate. Uh, you know, they're not uh, gonna, gonna blow it. If it's quality work being done by quality people that the industry knows and trusts, that always helps mm -hmm. rather than cutting a corner to getting it done you know, by, by someone that nobody's familiar with. Right. That may, be, may sound harsh on some of the new guys trying to make their way into the business, but it's, uh, it'll be more attractive if it's a name. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Ron. Well, I think that's a reasonable place to kind of wrap up for our conversation today. Is there anything that I, that I didn't ask that you think is worth mentioning about the, let's say the, the junior industry? Well, it's a lot of fun. It's been, uh, been great for me. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, other than being, you know, board member here and there, I'm, uh, I'm not doing any, uh, I'm not, I don't get a, any W-2 income anymore. That's, that's income we get for a salary. I don't kind of, I'm a little bit past that age-wise now, more or less retired, but uh, no, it's a good business. Uh, there are a lot of very serious people in the business. And I think if, if, again, if you're looking at companies, I'd look at the people behind them first. Mm -hmm. I'd look at the properties after that. You, you're really betting on people when you start betting on junior companies. You know, uh, if it's a company run by run by accountants and lawyers, that's one thing. If it's a company run by fellows that have uh, 25 years or 20 years experience in uh, in exploration, who knew what they're doing in that regard, for a junior company, mm -hmm. you, you need all these people to build mines. But junior companies are usually trying to find deposits, and then maybe somebody else will you know make it into a mine. But Bank bet bet first on the people, bet on their judgment on what is a good property, and then then look at the properties and and then follow the results, see how they can do with it. People are first. Excellent. Well, I, I really appreciate all your your advice and your perspective today, Ron. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, my pleasure. Appreciate you calling. <laughs> This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. 
Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.